Dr. Azra Raza, you have a new book out called The First Cell. What's the message of your book? The message is early detection and prevention of cancer way before it becomes the end stage monstrosity that has been an, a stigma for centuries. If you had a goal with this book, what would the goal be? To bring the patient back front and center into every conversation about cancer. To look at everything we are doing in the cancer paradigm through the prism of human anguish. And let everyone see what are the human costs of pursuing cancers to the last. Your book uh, for readers, well, they'll find an interesting mix. It's got poetry in it. It's got patient stories. And it also has a great deal of uh, technical, clinical analysis in it. So with that combination, what were you thinking when you were writing it? Who's your intended audience? More than the audience, Susan, it was the way I was trying to tell the story. First, I was only going to write about my patients and uh, not put anything personal in it. But once I told their stories in deep, granular detail, I felt dishonest holding back my own. There was a, somehow a level of insincerity in going into the depth and profundity of patients' feelings and anguish of families and not talking about my own. And when I started thinking about my own, it was as if Emily Dickinson spoke to me directly. What does poetry do for you? Yes, Dickinson says at one point, I felt a cleavage in my mind as if my brain was split. I tried to match it seam by seam, but could not make them fit. The thought behind I strove to join unto the thought before, but sequence raveled out of reach like balls upon the floor. Why did this, these few lines spoke volumes to me? Because when I am facing a patient, Susan, whether it was my own husband, who was head of a cancer center and in a cruel twist of irony was diagnosed with the very disease he had dedicated his life to cure since he was 15, or with, whether it is sitting across an examination room from a total stranger who within 20 minutes will be telling me the most intimate details of their lives. When I hear those, I feel my brain is split in two because on the one hand, I know pretty much what is coming their way by listening to their stories. But on the other hand, there is a wonder about the essential mystery of this individual sitting in front of me. What will their journey be like? What obstacles will we meet? And my brain is split, as Emily Dickinson describes. So when you ask me what poetry does for me, I come from a deeply oral culture. The oral tradition is such that since as long as we can remember, we were made to memorize poetry. Because two lines of poetry, which is called a couplet in Urdu in my language, they are like the two strands of DNA. Within those 25 words or less is a macrocosm represented in a microcosm of words. Just the same way a few thousand base pairs of DNA can code for a protein that can make a cell a red cell or make a sperm or, a, uh, or an egg into what their natural existence should be. And so to me, there is great parallels between science and poetry, between a DNA, double helix of DNA and the two lines of poems. So what exactly is cancer? Cancer is immortalization of a cell, in simple words. It's freedom from growth controlling signals, either from within itself or from outside itself. So unchecked growth for no essential purpose that it is serving, except its own purpose of just continuous proliferation and division. 
that is what we call this purposeless growth as a malignant growth, which ends up killing itself along with the host. How many kinds of cancer do we know about? Hundreds. And, and within each, sorry, within each cancer, there are hundreds of cancers that exist. So there's an infinite um, variations and variability. Traditionally, we kind of classify cancers as belonging to an organ. So there's a breast cancer, a lung cancer, a bone marrow cancer, ovarian cancer. But at a molecular, genetic, fundamental, biologic level, these can be classified very differently. There are cancers associated with a certain genetic uh, mutation, for example, whether it exists in the lung or the liver or the kidneys, that genetic mutation could cause a cancer in each organ. So we would then be classifying cancer not on the basis of organs, which would be self-limiting, but then on the basis of its uh, fundamental biologic characteristics, which would then lead to varieties of cancer ad infinitum within each cancer. And therein lies the challenge. Therein lies the challenge. So uh, this, uh, this question may be the whole purpose for your book, but have scientists identified the trigger points that start this initial mutation? Do we know in society, for example, or in the body what starts the whole process? It's very interesting that when you trace the history of cancer, which one of my colleagues, Siddhartha Mukherjee at Columbia University, has done beautifully in his book, The Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, if you look at the history of cancer, you can, going back to mummies, you find malignant growths that have uh, been discovered. And over the years, how the word cancer became associated with malignant disease um, and what has happened uh, to, uh, to understand the origin of uh, this very strange alien sort of uh, growth in the body. And uh, only once the uh, code for the DNA was finally understood and uh, biology morphed more towards a reductionist approach of molecular biology and then understanding of genes from Mendel onwards, all of these things combined together finally began to shed a light on what really is happening at the molecular level inside these cancers. And that's when it was realized that no matter what the fundamental cause of the disease is, eventually what has gone wrong is the messages coming out from the genes that are controlling either uh, helping growth or suppressing growth. Something has gone wrong with one of these two types of signals within this cell. So now it is fairly well accepted that uh, cancerous growths are the result of malfunctioning uh, of uh, genetic um, messages. So uh, things can trigger those malfunctions like smoking or other causes that are external to the body? Yes, one third of, for example, a third of the lung cancers can directly be attributed to um, what we call the exposome. Exosome is the, the exome is the collection of uh, uh, transcribed DNA that can be changed into a message, RNA, which carries the message to make proteins. The, the collection of that kind of DNA is called exome. But the same way an exposome is something that you are exposed to. So it's not just the exomes, but the exposome that has also gone wrong. It's seed and soil. How pervasive is cancer? You know, a lot of numbers are thrown around, but the one that is uh, most accepted is that one in two men and one in three women in their lifetime will be faced with this problem. And how curable are those statistics? Do, are they automatically a death sentence in those one in, out of two, one out of three? No, absolutely not, Susan. This is the good news, that today we are curing 68% of the cancers that are diagnosed. You would think that this number seems much higher than previously. Nobody imagined that one in two men and one in three women will face cancer. But there are a couple of reasons for it which are so obvious. The first is 
our population is aging and cancer is a disease of older age. So the more older people there are, the more cancers will be occurring. And the second one is that because we have learned to detect cancer earlier and earlier, so it, we are just finding more and more cases now. So it's not as if the incidence of cancer is increasing per se, but because the population is living longer and because of early detection, that seems to have gone up. Um, you asked me, how is this an automatic death sentence? It used to be, and thus the stigma associated with it. But, um, but now uh, we are curing practically 70% of the patients because of early detection and because of uh, the other main reason is the anti-smoking campaign. So going back to your point about exposure, yes, these two are very important things because of which lives are being saved. That seems like a lot of good news. <clears throat> so where is your frustration? I know on the surface I should be proclaiming victory from the rooftops right now, that we have gone from basically having a universal death sentence, as you said, to curing 68% of cancers today, and only 32% people die, but with both groups, the treatable and the non-treatable one. I ask a very fundamental question. The people we are curing, 68%, my frustration is why are we still using these paleolithic approaches of slash, poison, and burn? Where have $200 billion of research gone? Why are we not finding better ways of treating cancer instead of cutting it out or poisoning it either through chemical poisons or through radiation therapy? I mean, pediatric oncologists are forever thumping themselves on the chest and proclaiming that they are curing 95 or 90 percent children with cancer. But look what you are doing to these children. 20 to 80 percent will end up with developmental defects or problems that make lives very difficult for them as they grow. Why? Because look what we are doing to them. The second issue with this treatable, curable population is that, Susan, do you know that one in five new cancers appear in cancer survivors? What's the reason for that? Well, one reason is, of course, that whatever caused their first cancer is still there. But a second could be, look what we did to them. How much damage did we create by giving poisons like chemotherapy and radiation therapy to them? Did that also contribute? So that's my one frustration, that if research and all this influx of hundreds of billions of dollars and 50 years with hundreds of thousands of the most brilliant minds in the world working in this area have not come up, have only come up with treatments that still rely on those Stone Age strategies, uh, then what's the use of this research? So Arthur Miller, a great playwright, said something which has always stuck with me, which is if today does not offer justification for hope, then tomorrow is the only grail worth investing in. So today, if all of this money, all of this intellectual uh, focus and attention has gotten us no better than a few, really, except for a few cancers for which targeted therapies which don't depend on these strategies, then what's the point? Most common cancers remain only treatable by these. And then on the other hand is those 30 to 40 percent people for whom the diagnosis is a death sentence. That would be bad enough that it's a death sentence, but what do we do to them till they reach that final terminal moment, that itself is something which is cause for us to pause and really think deeply about what we are doing, because the primary rule of medicine is first do no harm. So what are we doing to these 32% people for whom we know from the moment of discovery that their chance of cure is basically 0, 0.00? So <clears throat> why has the system not responded? Why does it continue to, to use these methods? <clears throat> 
first of all, it's not for lack of trying. I mean, we've all been trying to develop new strategies. It's always easy to look back in hindsight and start pointing fingers, but the first person to whom I point fingers is myself. What have I been doing? I have been on the front lines of this whole paradigm for 30 plus years. Uh, where are my solutions? And a couple of reasons for it are, um, I don't want to go into a personal thing right now, but I wanted to answer more in a general way. Why, have, why has uh, cancer treatment failed so spectacularly to come up with new solutions? Uh, we pin our hopes on one thing, test it for a decade, and then pronounce it as a failure, move on to the next fashionable cycle. And I have lived through multiple cycles of great excitement followed by crushing disappointments. Um, I'll give you examples of this. In the 19, late 70s, early 80s, it was all about oncogenes, which is a normal gene which is uh, present in our bodies in animals has been found to cause cancer in them. And we realize that we are carrying proto-oncogenes that can become oncogenic. They can cause cancer within our bodies with slight changes in their uh, control. So we knew oh, we, there was so much excitement that once we find the oncogene causing pancreatic cancer, the oncogene cas causing leukemia, we'll just come up with antidotes. The solution will be easy. It's the finding the gene. And so almost a decade went into search for more and more and more. But it turned out that um, oncogenes are uh, not that easy a target because in any given cancer, there are mutations in multiple oncogenes. So how do you now go ahead and target? In the 90s, it was all about sequencing the human genome. And then in 90s, one of the greatest excitement was that, oh, cancers need to divide in an unchecked, infinite manner. So they need a lot of nutrition. How do they get nutrition? Then they make new blood vessels. So why don't we choke off their blood supply and just starve them to death? And that became a holy grail in the 90s until we discovered that, oh, we were very successful in curing mice with this approach. There's a lot of healthy mice running around in New York because of it. but. When we tried to translate it and bring it to the bedside, it was a, basically a spectacular failure in most cancers, except <coughs> a couple of drugs that are anti-angiogenic. Uh, mainly, that approach failed. Then we pinned our hopes on the, on the sequencing of the human genome. And the most important targeted therapy did come out uh, even before the human genome was, uh, or just around the time it was sequenced. And that is treatment for chronic myeloid leukemia, which is a very particular kind of disease in which there is a chronic stable phase. And if the patients are caught at that point, the only one gene causing one disease, and that can be targeted with one drug, imatinib. And this was done, and this is, became the most successful treatment of a cancer with targeted therapy. While it helps CML, chronic myeloid leukemia patients, it proved to be a little bit of a disservice to the rest of the cancer field. Why? Because we believe that now all we have to do is find that one gene that causes the one cancer in each organ and target it. It turned out that no, in the actual cancer cell that exists uh, in, let's say, an organ like the lung or the brain or the pancreas is a moving target. It's constantly picking up new mutations. Each time it divides, it makes DNA copying errors, which are inherent mistakes that uh, every time a cell divides, it will make them. But because cancer cells are dividing so much more rapidly, they pick up more and more mutations. So each time a cancer cell divides into two, it's making potentially two new cancers now with new mutations. So the co complexity of cancer comes mainly from, um, and, and our inability to develop new therapies comes from the fact that it is a very, very complex disease. 
within the cancer cell, the trafficking of signals is more complicated, more distorted, more intricate than um, the trafficking in the London underground. And it keeps changing because of acquiring new mutations. So the disease is so com complex by now, so complicated, that if we were to try and understand at the, cell at the genetic level and molecular level, every single signaling pathway that has gone awry in a cancer cell. It would take a few thousand years to come up with a solution and may never be a solution for that unless we stop, catch it when it's just starting and kill it. So as a layperson listening, the argument should be if there's an aha moment, we should, the researchers should continue to pursue other avenues as that one's being investigated. Instead, everyone follows on one course for a long time, and then if it doesn't turn out, that period of time is wasted. Is that an interpretation of what you've just told me? I think that would be a harsh interpretation, Susan, because along the way, we, are, we may be failing our patients, but we are very successful in understanding the biology of cancer, which is going to help the patients in the end. All I'm saying is it's going to take much longer. Okay. So I wouldn't say that it's all wasted effort at all. No. It, there are four million papers written on cancer already. And they have shed really dramatic light on, onto our understanding of, um, of how cells divide, how life happens, how aging happens. It's dramatic. It's spectacular. The problem is none of those things have been translated into improved therapies for our patients. And that's my frustration. I'm not saying we should stop all cancer research or it's been all wasted effort and money. Absolutely not. What I'm saying is, and the other problem is, of course, we have current patients. We can't only think about the future. We have to worry about who, we, who has cancer now. So all I'm saying is that my frustration comes from exact one of the things you pointed out. Why focus on one thing? Why not take off our blinders and see the situation for what it is? Accept the fact that what we are trying to do at this level is too complicated. But we need to keep understanding the biology better. How should we progress in this area? And on the other hand, that approach won't work for our patients who we have right now or who are coming in the future and try to reallocate the resources so that at least in the future we avoid these kinds of end stage patients that we are seeing. Tell me about the kinds of cancer you research and treat because uh, your patients are at the unhappy end of the statistics you told me about, those with less chance of surviving their disease. Tell me about what you treat. I began my career actually um, because I have been interested in biology all my life since I was a kid. I just started following ants around. I became a serious myrmecologist for the longest time, myrmecophile. Um, and then evolution um, really caught my attention and I became deeply affected by this whole concept of evolution by natural selection and speciation and all. And that's uh, led me to, uh, to seriously start looking at embryology and things like that and how life comes into existence. And I wanted to become, uh, at 16, 17 years of age, a molecular biologist. Uh, but in Pakistan, where I grew up, Susan, we did not have uh, such uh, uh, opportunities for postgraduate or graduate studies, at this level at least. So my only entry into science would be through going to medicine. And I reluctantly went into medicine thinking that I will finish uh, my medical education and then move on to what I really want to do in the lab. Except when I saw the first patients that changed my life forever because I knew that from that moment on I could not look at anything except through the clinical glasses that had been provided to me, the, the suffering of patients and how urgent it is um, 
and that keeps coming back to me. Um, I'll give you an example. My husband died after a, almost a five-year-long battle with cancer. When he was diagnosed, our daughter was four years old. When he died, she was uh, eight, and eight and a half or something. So after he died a few weeks later, Shehrzad, my daughter, who's eight years old, got the flu, but a really nasty one. After a, almost a week of suffering, she started to improve, getting better. And one morning, I was sitting in the living room, working early in the morning. She came out of her room sobbing. As a mother, I was immediately convinced she's worse. She's had a relapse. Something is terribly wrong. I rushed over. What is it, honey? What's wrong? Are you much worse? And she was inconsolable. Once she got uh, calmed down a little, this is what she said. Actually, mom, I feel much better today. I feel totally fine. But now I know what it means to be so sick and how good it feels to get better. And my dad never got better. That's the kind of moment that makes you realize what real suffering is all about. I mean, this child who's eight years old who experiences the, the sudden insight. So I felt like my eyesight and my intellectual interests were suddenly given an insight by interaction with patients and direct experience of disease at that level. And once I got interested in cancer, Basically, I had a choice between two things, either study a solid tumor or study a liquid cancer. And why I chose a liquid cancer was that in a solid tumor, let's say there is a tumor in the lungs and I want to study it. I'll have to rely on surgeons to cut it out, give it to me. God knows what small part I'll get. I'll have to disaggregate it to get single cell suspensions to study. So much artificial things are caused to the tumor. And then secondly, if I want to study it again and another tumor arises in the same lung or somewhere else, it's not the same as the first tumor. So solid tumors to me were a very difficult challenge from the perspective of an investigator. On the other hand, in a liquid tumor like leukemia, cells are circulating throughout the body. You can just put a needle in, get as many as you want, or get a bone marrow biopsy uh, periodically. And you can monitor this before, during, after therapy. You can study them so many times. Plus, studying those cells in suspension in a liquid tumor are much easier in the lab. So for all these reasons, sorry to give you such a long answer, but I feel like it so defines the obsession I have with the disease I eventually ended up studying comes because this had been developing since I was very young. And there is a method to the madness which took me to this unpronounceable disease according to my husband, myelodysplastic syndrome. So once I decided to study the liquid tumors, I started working at Roswell Park Cancer Institute even before I started my residency in this area of acute myeloid leukemia. Literally from day one of my work in the US, in 1977, I began in studying and treating acute myeloid leukemia. By 1984, Susan, it was apparent to me beyond a shadow of doubt that this disease is so complicated that in my lifetime we will not be able to cure it. And the only things that seemed to matter at the time were if the cancer is, you know, anyone who gets cancer, the best news you can get is, oh, it was diagnosed early, so they have a good chance of cure. So if early detection was the only chance of cure, I started paying attention to my patients with acute leukemia who would give a history that for six months or a year we had had low blood counts. And that state was called pre-leukemia. So I felt like why didn't we catch it then in the pre-leukemia earlier stage? Why did we let it become this kind of uh, terminal uh, 
rapidly proliferating aggressive disease. So I turned my attention now to studying uh, pre-leukemia and following those patients as they developed acute leukemia. So you asked me what kind of cancer am I studying? I began by studying acute myeloid leukemia because it was a liquid tumor and then ended up by uh, focusing my attention more on the pre-leukemic disease which is called myelodysplastic syndromes or MDS for short. Although one of my patients, Lady N in the book said, it stands for my disease stinks. <laughs> <laughs> but MDS is really the earlier part. Not every patient develops leukemia. A third of them develop leukemia. Two thirds can live for very long times as pre-leukemia. And some of them will die of just pre-leukemia as their counts become worse and worse without developing leukemia. So that's what I study now. How, how often in your profession do people both treat and research? Rarely now. There was a time when we could do both, but the knowledge uh, base has expanded so much now that it's literally impossible to do both. But I am one of those old timers, luckily, who got focused on one disease very earlier on because of my own obsessive personality that whatever I just get obsessed with, that's it now. I, I mean, literally, I say that in the book as well, that if I'm given 72 more lives, I'll do each time the same thing in, in honor of my patients. Well, your book tells the story of a number of those. I wanted to show a video of one that you referenced briefly as a way to talk about her and some of your other patients. This is Julie Yip Williams. We're going to watch a little video and then talk about why it's important to hear cancer patients' stories. Let's watch. I found that there was a real absence of truth out there about living with this disease and about what it's like to face death. So when I started writing, I vowed often in my writing, I said, you know, I know this is really depressing and I know this is really dark, but I swore I would always be honest with you, my readers. There's a lot of anger and there's a lot of jealousy, there's a lot of bitterness, a lot of fear when you live with this diagnosis. Once I started writing about it, it was like I let it go and I felt free. I no longer carried that burden and writing was my freedom, is my freedom. Now, Julie, we learned, uh, died on March 19th, 2018 at the age of 42, uh, but she told her story all along the way and you tell the story of others like Omar and Andrew. Why do you want the rest of us to hear cancer patient stories? I think here in Susan is the importance of the subtitle of my book. The human costs of what we are doing is so important to me. And the human costs can only be illustrated in the depth in which we need to see them if we follow what happens to patients with the current treatment regimens that are given. Um, and that was my reason that if we are going to tell the story of cancer, we have to see what is uh, what it is doing to people uh, who are young. Andrew was 22 when he was diagnosed. Umar was 38 when he was diagnosed. My patient JC is only 34 when she's uh, dying. But on the other hand, Harvey was diagnosed at 57, my late husband. Um, uh, other patients are in their 60s, 80s. There is a patient in the 90s. There's no age that is immune from cancer. So the book of the seven chapters, only three are younger than 40 years. The others are all older. At every level, there is a different kind of uh, suffering and pain that these patients are. Not just the patients, the cost to their families. And that's why one of the unique things that uh, this, this book allowed me to do was to go back to the families after a certain length of time um, from when they lost their loved ones and ask them to cast a backward glance and now question the decisions that were made, the choices that were given to them. Would they have altered anything? What does that kind of perspective tell us about human suffering? Was dying a failure for the beloved ones? Or was the denial of death a failure on their parts? 
When someone receives a diagnosis of the kinds of cancer that you treat, what other option is there besides the, uh, the ones that you call slash and burn? Uh, what, what could they do other than that? For most common types of cancers, very little. As I said, there are some cancers which are targetable with um, different new therapies. For example, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia is targeted with uh, imatinib, a drug that there, that is not a chemotherapy. There are other small molecules that have been developed that can interrupt pathways. Most of them are just palliative rather than curative. So they help you for a, a fraction of the patients for a limited amount of time, and that's it. Um, so what a patient can do besides the traditional approaches that are given, very little, even though those who can afford it will keep going from one oncologist to a second opinion and a third opinion from one big cancer center to another big cancer center um, with that uh, hope that somebody might offer them something different, but there isn't any. So when you describe the choices, I guess it's a question of what you learn from the families by talking to them afterwards. I mean, really, what other options did they have other than the path that they chose? What did you learn from the family's experience with these patients? I mean, it's not just what I learned from these patients, but I see 30 to 40 patients every week now, what I learn on a daily basis from my patients and what every other treating oncologist is facing. It's not just unique to me. We learn all the time from every day of our lives when we are interacting with patients. And with each patient, as I said, there's a split in my brain because at one level I do know what to expect. At another level, it's completely unpredictable and unexpected un un uh, in many, many patients. But the one thing I have learned is that there is no oncologist that I have met in my lifetime who didn't care for their patients. And no oncologist I know has a simple algorithm which they follow with everybody and get the same answers. Uh, what, it, what I've learned from these patients is, importantly, you can never take away hope. But that optimism has to also be combined at some level with the pessimism of intellect, which means understanding the gravity of the situation, but somehow not taking away hope. I mean, Harvey, my late husband, was the head of the cancer center. He was one of the most knowledgeable people about cancer in the world. And he gets leukemia, and now we see a mass on his chest x-ray. Uh, MRI, it's done. We see that this is now a fungal mass. There's no question. How many fungal infections has Harvey treated in his life? And yet, Susan, he would turn to me at that moment and say, as, what do you think? Because he made, allowed me to decide how he should feel and react to this menace that is appearing, that we both know what it means. Yet I took infinite care not to break his spirit. And that's what patients had taught me all these years, that we can't take away hope, we can't break their spirit, even while recognizing full well what is in store for them. Our job is to help them face it as well as possible and deal with it on a daily basis and spend as much time as we can with them, trying to help them do it, and not hand them over at the end to some hospice care. You uh, write about the, not just the emotional cost of this, but also the enormous financial burden that treatment has. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what this does to families financially, is when, financially when they face a, a major cancer diagnosis? and? and really what options society has for that. Yes. 
Well, I can say it in one sentence is that it is uh, the whole entire uh, market side of this cancer paradigm is on the verge of a collapse because the not just the physical and emotional burden but the financial burden is such that nine million newly diagnosed cancer patients were looked at and followed for a period and studies show that 42 percent of cancer patients in America today 42 percent become completely ruined by two plus years of their diagnosis. Financially ruined. Financially ruined. They lose every penny of their life savings. So what does that mean? It doesn't just affect them and no one is cured or very few are cured. What does this mean? It means that not only they are ruined, their next generation is there. The financial ruin is reflected in everybody in the family. Is this a statistic uh, that is uh, endemic to the United States only because of our health care system? Does that same financial ruin happen in other countries for, with socialized medicine, for example? I don't know that much about other countries. I do know one thing, Susan, that everyone looks to America for leadership. I mean, I can quote numbers like we spend 27 percent more per capita on health care in America than we do in other developed countries in the West. I don't know what these statistics mean. It's a correct statistic, by the way. We do spend a third more than other countries, but then we do offer a lot more things and uh, we see our patients immediately. We, they don't have to wait around for months for their turn to come. There are other problems that uh, the countries are facing. Um, I don't feel competent about uh, really expressing an opinion on this, except to say that this is everyone is looking to us. So the paradigm is that the cancer treatment costs a lot because the research that goes into developing the treatments costs so much. Is that correct? No, it's not that simple at all. So Susan. why does it cost so much to treat cancer? It's not just cancer, it's the entire healthcare system. If you read Stephen Brill's article, Bitter Pill, that came out in 2013 on the cover of Time magazine, an extraordinarily long, uh, long uh, piece that basically uh, highlighted the various levels at which our healthcare system is failing us financially. Um, it's very easy, for example, in cancer to point to pharmaceutical companies and say, oh, uh, look, this drug, they developed drug XYZ. This drug is prolonging the lives of pancreatic cancer patients by 12 days, but it costs $26,000 a year. What kind of insanity is this? That kind of thing is easy to point and very conveniently everyone will target pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but I ask you this, if you go to um, buy 100 tablets of Tylenol at the drugstore, you can get them for less than $5. But if you are going to be admitted to any hospital, whether it's a small community hospital or a big cancer center, you could be charged $2 for one tablet of Tylenol that you take. Um, a Band-Aid. You can buy a hundred for three ninety nine, but if uh, we put one on you in a hospital, it could cost you fifty dollars. Why? We can't just keep blaming pharmaceutical companies. Why are hospitals charging so much? Why are non-profit hospitals, uh, so many cancer centers, the biggest cancer centers, are all non-profit, which and yet they make profits in hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Where is that profit going? There are no shareholders. It doesn't go get distributed to anyone. Then they buy more practices and expand themselves more and hire more business people to run it. I mean, all of this keeps driving up the cost. And the biggest cost, as you mentioned, is also because of um, the fact that the way our research works right now to develop new drugs in cancer, for example, it works like something like this. The National Cancer Institute can fund grants for an individual investigator like me to work in my lab and identify a protein, a pathway, which I think if, can be a good target for 
attacking this cancer and getting rid of it. So I'm funded by NC National Cancer Institute. I find this. Now I also show that this drug works uh, in petri dishes in stopping cancer here. But now I have to try it in humans. Before going to humans, I'll have to try it in two mammals first, uh, which are animal models. And then once I bring it to trial, the phase one trial will cost $50 million. Phase two will cost 150 to 300 million. Phase three will cost probably 500 million. So by the time we go from, and that kind of money cannot be uh, invested in me uh, by the government or National Cancer Institute. So now the pharmaceutical companies who have the bandwidth will step in, take over this target from me, and take it to the next stage of development. They will end up spending anywhere from one to $2.7 billion, and take 10 years to develop this drug. Finally, they bring it. The approval rate for such drugs, Susan, right now is 5%. 95% drugs fail by the bedside in phase three trials today in cancer. So why are companies and people ready to invest billions of dollars and decades of work into an enterprise that is chance of 95% chance of failing? Why? Because if one of their drugs is approved, then they will make billions from it for years to come. And then we are institutions like FDA and NIH, which are supposed to protect us uh, patients, they now have lost control completely. They have no say over what prices are set by them. So it's such a complicated system that has evolved over the last three, four decades that is very easy to, uh, it's very difficult to identify any one thing, like is it the research where the money is being wasted? Is it the clinical trials or the animal models or what is it? I'd say it's a combination of all of these things, but it's untenable. It is unsupportable. It is on the verge of collapse, as I said. So uh, getting back to the patients, because I would like to hear your prescription for what to do to start that process of change. But getting back to the patients themselves, is there a point um, at which the doctor involved uh, should give them a, a, a choice between two paths that uh, you can go forward with this treatment, but it's going to do this to your, likely to do this to your body? or you can choose a palliative care? Um, and do we, does the system do that well enough, often enough? Uh, because you talk about what it does to the body, the enormous expense, the emotional toll. So is that process working as well as it should? As I said, uh, the majority of patients are treatable. Yes, yeah, so I'm talking about the big cancers. The big cancers where advanced disease uh, has to be dealt with, where the, uh, outcome is very negative, and we know it. Um, but then even there, there'll be occasionally anecdotal survivors for much longer than we expected. Basically, it is very hard to tell a 22-year-old that you are going to either die of cancer or die of the treatment we give. Now choose between one or the other. The mother of Andrew would always say, even if there's one in a million chance, I want to take it. Or Umar's mother, Nahid, who's one of my best friends, would say, anything. And as she says, she lived in a fog from the moment of discovery that he had cancer, that she entered this state where she was not willing to hear anything negative, because that would allow her, uh, that would cause her to collapse. And she wouldn't be able to even, I mean, you don't register all this consciously. But this is what happens, that uh, uh, the choices we give to our patients are spelled out in fine print on consent forms that are 50 pages thick. But the only thing patients will read is that one possibility that they will respond. We keep saying this about patients, that they'll concentrate on what gives them hope. But oncologists, we do the same, Susan. When we are talking to our patients, yes, we always tell them the negative things that can happen, but we also stress that one possibility, even if it's in you know a small possibility, that look, you could be one of the people who do well. So they 
invariably the majority will choose that over palliative care because what do they have to lose by trying that? And they don't really know what they have to lose because they don't know the extent. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. You said it very well. They don't know the physical toll, the emotional toll, the toll to the family, and the fiscal burden. So let's move, we have about 10 minutes left in our conversation to um, the community's reaction to, you've been speaking about this for a while now, uh, how are you seen within the oncology community? Are you a welcome voice or something other? Dramatically welcome. You know, my colleague said the Siddhartha Mukherjee who wrote the book Emperor of All Maladies, um, he was my interlocutor at a couple of uh, uh, venues. And one of the opening things he said was, so basically, Azra, what you are showing is that the emperor has no clothes. And he is uh, an authority on the history of cancer, which he has told beautifully in The Emperor of All Maladies. Um, my colleagues across the country have been so supportive. Everywhere I have gone, I have gone to on my book tour from Washington, D.C. to Connecticut to Seattle to San Francisco and Portland. People who have interviewed me are extremely well-known, well-respected, leading oncologists and scientists in the country. And everybody agrees with me. There is a level of frustration in all of us who are dealing with cancer. It's not just me alone. And it's not like I'm saying something new. Really, everyone knows that early detection of cancer is the best protection against dying from it. Early detection and treatment. So what I'm saying is that why are we still using very old techniques that were developed 50 years ago for early detection, like mammograms, colonoscopy. Imagine putting a tube in to look for cancer. In this day and age of technology, we are where we boast of cutting and pasting DNA like gods. Why are we using those kinds of things to go for early detection and say, oh, early detection doesn't work every time. We could over-diagnose, we could over-treat. No, what I'm saying is let us bring, it's like the moonshot where you bring all your faculties to bear, you bring all your technology to bear, and use this kind of new age technology. The next generation of devices and scanners and biomarkers, uh, protein codes that can be made into a barcode which has uh, pancreatic, ovarian, lung, leukemia, brain cancers all in a row and you just have it on a chip and the chip is inserted under the skin and automatically a, some, a small device like your phone can detect the appearance of uh, you know, the earliest footprints of a cancer cell. Why aren't we investing in that kind of thing instead of uh, constantly using the same old, same old chasing down cancer to the last cell, even if the patient dies in the bargain? Where is that kind of approach likely to come from in our society? It's already happening. No one can stop this revolution now. Because uh, pretty much all of healthcare uh, is realizing we haven't found for cure for much. The most important cure we have ever found in uh, medicine is that for infectious diseases with antibiotics that doubled human lifespan, right? But more important than antibiotics, Susan, what happened in, in infectious disease is vaccination, prevention. We don't talk about polio and tetanus and rabies and smallpox anymore because they, we wipe those things out, basically. And that happened because of prevention. So we know that even in the only disease, infectious disease, where we have such cures, for stroke we have no cure, for diabetes, for high blood pressure, we don't, unless we go in and fix the coronaries. Again, cardiovascular deaths have been brought down by 70%, again, because of early detection of coronary artery disease and fixing it, preventing it from becoming a heart attack. So my colleagues around the country, very supportive of this idea, all of healthcare becoming aware that the future of healthcare depends on early detection of Alzheimer's disease, of Parkinson's disease, of cancer, of... Uh, 
neurologic disease, everything, early detection and prevention. And prevention not just by lifestyle changes, but actually proactive prevention, where you go in, you detect the biomarkers, don't rely on any one test, do 50 tests to support. If I detect a first cell of pancreatic cancer in my body from a liquid biopsy from the blood, I need to now confirm that from scanning devices, uh, which can scan me in the shower, uh, sheets that I use overnight, which can image whether there is a hot spot in my pancreas or not, uh, biomarkers detected from tears and saliva and sweat and urine and stool and uh, uh, when we brush our teeth, uh, the, uh, the, there is a part of the saliva taken and tested. All of these things together when they are combined and suggest that yes, there is a potentially lethal presence that's growing, that's when we can move in and use the same targeted therapies that are failing in end-stage cancer can work in early cancer. So you are hopeful. The whole book is a message of hope, of optimism, of looking forward to the future, but by telling the stories of what is happening now. The purpose of telling these painful stories is not to revel in pain and suffering, Susan, but to liberate us from the past, to liberate us from doing these things again and again, to have a forward-looking, imaginative, more... Uh, exciting approach which is less painful to the patients and less um, expensive. Um, I'll end this part of the answer by saying that just uh, last week my younger brother Abbas who lives in Italy now and who runs this amazing website Three Quarks Daily uh, to which we have been posting and linking stories for the last 15 years every morning. He sent me a link to um, a story which is pointing out that the Japanese have just um, uh, developed the test from one drop of blood which can detect mark early markers of 13 different types of cancers which you can do at home which will cost $180. This can sound like a pie in the sky or oh another Elizabeth Holmes Theranos story but these are actually seriously happening now. Theranos may have failed, but that doesn't mean the technology is a failure. No, the technology is being developed. There is no escape from it. We are going forward with it, and this is how the future will be, prevention and early detection. So we end on that message of hope. Dr. Raza, thank you very much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you. Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast at cspan.org.